Effect studies were carried out on a wide variety of near-surface nuclear detonations to increase knowledge of the basic effects of megaton rain shots and the effects on structures and materiel, especially of megaton rain shots. To extend the knowledge of basic effects of nuclear detonations, three programs were instituted on Operation Hardtack. Underground studies of acceleration, displacement, pressures, and shock spectra. Radiation studies of neutron flux and fallout from megaton devices. Electromagnetic studies of pulses from nuclear detonations and ionospheric effects of surface detonations. Ground motion measurements were made on two surface bursts, the 17 kiloton cactus and the 1.4 megaton COA detonations. Emphasis was on obtaining measurements in high overpressure regions for use in the design of hard protective structures. The effect of soil type and weapon yield on ground shock was of particular interest. Participation in cactus supplied low yield coral soil data for comparison with results obtained in Nevada soil from shots of similar yield. COA provided high yield data for comparison with the low yield cactus data obtained in similar soil. Underground accelerations and displacements produced by COA and cactus were measured in regions where air overpressures were up to 900 PSI. COA measurements, in particular, were at three ranges from 2,000 feet to 4,000 feet from ground zero and at depths down to 100 feet. Underground pressure measurements were made with flexible drumhead gauges. These were buried at depths from surface down to 20 feet at the 200 PSI range on both shots. Canisters with vibrating reed type gauges were installed with their tops flush to the ground surface and inside flexible arch structures at overpressure ranges from 75 to 200 PSI. The response of these gauges to ground shock is being used to broadly delineate the response of structures or instrumentation to the same shock environment. An air blast line was installed to provide air overpressure measurements for correlation with the ground shock data. To complete the specification of the ground shock environment, crater measurements on both shots were taken by lead line and photographic techniques. On the COA shot at 2,000 feet range, just 150 feet outside the crater, peak vertical acceleration of 1120 g was recorded at one foot depth. Peaks decreased rapidly with depth to 68 g at 10 feet and then slowly to 8.4 g at 100 foot depth. Vertical accelerations at 3,150 feet range show similar decrease with depth from 441 g near the ground surface to 1 g at 100 foot depth. Maximum vertical acceleration on the cactus shot was 616 g at 400 foot ground range and 1 foot depth. Cactus peak vertical accelerations also showed rapid decrease with depth. On both shots, Peak vertical acceleration showed a more rapid decrease with depth than at Nevada at similar air overpressure ranges. Horizontal ground accelerations on both shots were higher than those observed at similar air overpressure ranges in Nevada. On COA, peak horizontal accelerations at 2,000 feet range varied from 40 g at 10 foot depth to 51 g at 50 feet depth to 5.6 g at 100 foot depth. Observed acceleration records did not follow as simple a pattern as previously observed from airbursts at NTS. Nevada acceleration traces are more readily related to the shape and strength of the air blast wave, which generates a ground shock as it arrives at a location. The EPG records of the hardtack shots, cactus in particular, are much more complex. The high seismic velocity characteristics of the coral soil causes early arrival of refracted and direct earth-transmitted energy, which in many instances masks effects 
due to the local air blast slap. Relative displacement measurements between the ground surface and the 50 and 100 foot depths on both shots showed smaller displacements than expected from Nevada results. The largest was less than three inches. Underground pressure measurements taken with flexible drum heads show pressures a few feet below the surface are considerably lower than surface air over pressures. However, at 10 foot depth, pressures begin to increase. On cactus in particular, a pressure of 500 PSI at 20 foot depth was recorded, twice the surface overpressure. It is believed the abnormally high underground pressures are due to the effects of large amounts of groundwater in the soil. Measurements of air blast phenomena, which were made over extended blast lines for cactus and koa, did not indicate a precursor formed on either event. Wave forms generally showed sharp rises, but were more disturbed for cactus than for koa. Peak pressures obtained with self-recording gauges compared favorably with pre-shot predictions. But those measured by electronic gauges at close in range for correlation with underground phenomena did not. Furthermore, waveform characteristics at these locations were quite different for the two events. Until further analysis is made, caution should be used in predicting underground structural damage at short ranges. Ground motion results indicate soil type and device yield play an important role in determining underground motion. Correlation of ground motion with air blast data is in progress in an effort to produce scaling relationships. Simple scaling relationships to give ground motion for a particular soil and weapon yield are not apparent. The radiation program studied neutron flux and fallout for megaton range bursts. The objectives of this program were to measure the complete neutron spectra as a function of range and to determine the relative contribution of certain radionuclides to both local and worldwide fallout resulting from megaton land and water service detonations. Instrumentation for the neutron flux dose measurements consisted of threshold activation and fission detector foils exposed along a single non-radial line from 900 to 4,100 yards from ground zero. This instrument line was used on two shots with predicted megaton range yields to document neutron flux spectra and neutron dose as a function of distance. Although only limited data resulted because the radiological situation prevented early recovery of the detectors, successful measurement of neutron flux and spectra were made for a number of ranges. The measured neutron doses were found to be lower by a factor of two than the TM23-200 predictions. In the study of radioactive fallout, two methods of sample collection were programmed. First, early cloud sampling by rocket. And second, residual cloud and fallout sampling by B-57 and WB-50 aircraft. Because of technical difficulties during pre-shot testing and early participation, the rocket sampling was canceled. The aircraft sampling program was successful on all shots in which the project participated. The B-57s collected gas and particulate samples from the residual cloud, while the WB-50s obtained downwind fallout samples at an altitude of 1,000 feet for various times following the detonation. Samples obtained from this program are presently undergoing detailed analysis and study in various laboratories, and any conclusions must await the completion of this work.
Electronic studies were made on two effects, the electromagnetic pulses and disturbance of the ionosphere as a result of nuclear detonations. To record the waveform of the electromagnetic pulse, two stations positioned 100 miles and 460 miles respectively from the burst point made broadband measurements from zero to 10 megacycles. Signals received by vertical probe antennae were fed into oscilloscopes and the resulting waveform was photographed. These studies were made on seven different shots, including the Yucca balloon detonation. From a comparison of this information with actual shot data, it is hoped that the electromagnetic pulse can be used to approximate total yield when the time and location of the nuclear detonation is known. To study the disturbance of the ionosphere as a result of surface detonations, a C4-type vertical ionospheric sounder was installed at Kusai Island, 460 miles south of Eniwetok Atoll. Similar equipment was located at Wake Island. These sounders emit 50 millisecond pulses at 60 pulses per second, with frequencies from 1 to 25 megacycles. After the signals are reflected from the ionosphere, the received signals are displayed on oscilloscopes as traces. These traces were then photographed for later analysis. The results of this experiment agreed with similar studies made on Operation Red Wing. The energy responsible for the first ionospheric disturbance travels at about 12.5 miles per minute. The energy responsible for a second disturbance travels at about 8 miles per minute. In addition to the basic effects program, other experimentation was conducted on material reactions to nuclear detonations. These studies were concerned with aircraft structural tests, underground structures, electronic fuse components, thermal studies of skin simulants and uniform materials, and material ablation. In the aircraft structural effects program, the delivery capabilities of three aircraft types were examined. The B-52 first tested on Operation Red Wing and two Navy carrier planes, the A-4D and FJ-4, both of whose responses to inputs from low-yield nuclear bursts were measured during Operation Plumbob. The objectives of this program were to measure the structural responses of these aircraft when subjected to the effects of high-yield nuclear detonations. The particular response data sought on the B-52 were side loads imposed by the effects from nuclear explosions in order to determine the aircraft's capability for multiple delivery strikes where blast and thermal loads could be received at any angle from weapons delivered by other aircraft. Overpressure input measurements for the B-52 proved to be approximately 10% less than predicted. The hardtack test results indicated that the analytical value for bending moment at wing station 1178 was a reliable guide to the capability of the wing. Fin and stabilization load data indicated that pre-hardtack correlation factors were appreciably below measured values obtained at some orientations. A more extensive analysis is now being performed to define the effects of overpressure diffraction loading and orientation on the fin and stabilizer responses. There was no evidence of damage from thermal energy or blast effects as a result of participations in the side-loading program. To aid in structural analysis of the A4D and FJ4, a method was employed for measuring transient input conditions on the wing as it was engulfed by the shock wave. This procedure utilized data obtained from several series of cordwise pressure pickups. Correlation data were obtained to examine the diffractional pulse and confirm the structural analysis by progressing from the shock waves measured overpressure input to measured aerodynamic reactions resulting from this overpressure, and hence to measured dynamic response of the structure. Using a conservative factor of 10%, the calculated input overpressures gave good correlation with the measured results. 
Satisfactory wing cordwise pressure distribution data were obtained. The data are sufficient that, from a careful analysis, the separate effects of overpressure propagation and gust velocity approaching from the trailing edge can be obtained. Although thermal input predictions were conservative, thermal responses correlated well. One participation, shot walnut, resulted in minor thermal damage on the two FJ-4 aircraft which participated. With blistering on the underside, burning of seals between movable and fixed control surfaces, as well as blistering on the rubber surface on back of the central pod and on the rubber seals on the bottom of the fuselage. The underground structure study was made in conjunction with the ground motion studies previously shown. This program was carried out on hardtack in order to provide input data for designers of hard protective structures. Previous studies have been confined to low yields and Nevada soils. These structures, prefabricated corrugated steel flexible arch structures, were the targets for design studies on underground structural response to air blast and ground shock the next step beyond the Priscilla findings of Operation Plumbob. Positioned in non-drag sensitive earthwork configurations of coral sand, they actually simulated balanced cut and fill buried structures. Inside the structures, floor slab accelerations, arch deflections and internal pressures were measured. Three of the arch shells were tested in the 80 to 180 PSI peak overpressure region from COA's 1.4 megaton surface detonation a long duration loading test. Another was placed in the 90 PSI peak overpressure region from the Cactus 17 kiloton burst to permit correlation of the effects of short duration blast loading in a similar configuration. The Cactus tested structure shown here, a 25 foot span by 48 feet, art structure of 10 gauge metal partially collapsed on the side away from ground zero. The collapse was apparently initiated by bearing failure of the shell plates at a bolted horizontal seam, about five feet above floor level on the collapse side. A similar structure, subjected to 78 PSI from shot COA, suffered a complete collapse symmetrically about the crown. The same effect was observed on a nearby 38-foot span by 40-feet arch structure of one-gauge metal under 100 PSI peak overpressure from COA. At 180 PSI, another 25-foot span 10-gauge structure collapsed until the crown touched the floor. High radiation levels on the COA exposed structures delayed complete recovery operations for a number of months. Pending full analysis, it appears that the Plumbob design recommendations for this type structure are still valid. To establish design criteria for ICBM and other massive reinforced concrete structures under blast loads, thick reinforced concrete slabs were placed in COA shots high pressure region, 175 to 600 PSI for dynamic behavior study. For this test, 30 slabs with reinforcing in one direction and 15 slabs with reinforcing in two directions were cast with spans of six feet and varying depths up to five feet. The slabs were placed flush with the ground surface to study flexure and shear strength, both with and without shear reinforcement. The results indicate that the resistance of the slabs to high blast pressures, particularly in respect to diagonal tension, was much greater than expected. After the high radiation level died down, the slabs were removed and examined to determine the magnitude and character of the permanent deformations. The data is currently being reduced and analyzed. One vital project expanded the Plumbob study of the effects of nuclear radiation on electronic fuse components and materials. The tests were conducted under simulated tactical and storage conditions in which instrumented corporal missile fuses and allied components were buried in proximity to several bursts of kiloton strength. 
Magnetic tapes recorded the data for later recovery and reading. Fuses and numerous types of components were subjected to neutron exposures of from 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 14th neutrons per square centimeter and gamma dosages of from 10,000 to 100,000 Rentgens. Since this project sought information on such questions as whether a missile during a multiple attack would function properly when a nuclear weapon burst nearby, it is noteworthy that many important changes in the electronic gear under test were observed. For example, some transistor parameters underwent transient changes 84 times their initial value without ensuing permanent damage. Plate currents of vacuum tubes changed up to 120%. Resistors exhibited decreases in resistance of from 10 to greater than 20% for periods of a millisecond. The corporal fuse system exhibited transient disturbances which indicate a high probability of premature firing when exposed to radiation doses as low as 10 to the 12th neutrons per square centimeter and 10,000 rentgens of gamma. In the thermal radiation study, exposing skin simulant specimens, both bare and covered with uniform materials, the objective was to validate laboratory methods of determining the degree of protection afforded by uniform materials under actual long-pulse megaton-type exposures. It was found that the field test results on the higher yield weapons differed in some respects from Naval Material Laboratory's predicted results. These differences indicated the possibility of a discrepancy between the laboratory simulated thermal pulse as well as lower effective radiating temperatures of larger yield weapons. In a study to determine the rate of ablation of materials, metal specimens were mounted on a 100-foot tower within the shot cactus fireball volume. Recording equipment and thermocouples were buried at various depths within the specimens to determine the ablation rate. Another specimen within the fireball volume was designed to measure the velocity of sound from which the temperature within the fireball could be calculated. The method used involved recording equipment and transducers to pick up the pressure pulses from a series of small HE charges set off at sequential times after time zero. Data were obtained and recorded. However, thorough laboratory analyses must be completed before any conclusions can be drawn. The effects programs we have just reviewed were all successful in gathering a vast amount of data, much of which is yet to be analyzed. Ultimately, the extent of knowledge concerning the effects of megaton detonations will be greatly advanced. A brief summary of these programs indicates that Soil types and yield are important in determining underground motion. However, simple scaling relationships are not apparent. Concurrent with the ground motion studies, the Underground Structures program tentatively confirmed the design recommendations for corrugated steel structures when extended to megaton range devices. Concrete slabs showed greater resistance to high blast pressures than expected. However, Further analysis is required before quantitative results can be determined. The radiation program produced the first successful documentation of integrated neutron flux as a function of range for megaton detonation. Analysis of fallout from megaton devices is still being conducted by the laboratories, and any conclusions must await the completion of this work. In the structural effects studies on the B-52, sufficient data were collected to substantiate a correlation between measured and analytical responses. This will establish a workable and reliable side-load computation procedure. For the A-4D and F-J-4, sufficient reliable data were obtained for correlation with response data obtained during Operation Plumbob to permit subsequent defining of the high-yield weapon delivery capabilities of these aircraft. In the study probing the effects on a corporal fuse system exposed in a nuclear environment, it is concluded at this stage of the analysis that the system is electronically affected sufficiently to make its operation highly suspect. In the thermal radiation tests, it was found that a possible discrepancy may exist between Naval Material Laboratory simulated thermal pulse and actual pulses. The data tends to reflect a lower effective radiating temperature for larger yield weapons. As in most of the experiments on hardtack, it is too early in the analysis stage to make definite conclusions. 
these must await further study of the great volume of data gathered. Today's increasing international emphasis on long-range ballistic missile activity raises to priority attention the mastering of high-altitude burst effect phenomenology. At stake are urgent problems, such as those associated with ICBM defense, as well as the upper air burst effects on radio communications and radar. Prior to 1958, only two nuclear shots had been fired at altitudes above 10,000 feet both comparatively low in height, both of small yield. The first was in 1955, a three kiloton airdrop during Operation Teapot, with height of burst at 36,000 feet above mean sea level. The other occurred in 1957 during Plum Bob. On hardtack, three high-altitude shots were fired to acquire data necessary to develop a national capability for high-altitude warfare. Yucca, a 1.7 kiloton device suspended from a balloon, and Teak and Orange, both 3.8 megaton devices carried by Redstone missiles. All were fired to obtain effects data for the fulfillment of three general objectives. First, to find out how extreme altitudes affect the partition of energy in a nuclear detonation and what is the radial extent of the various phenomena. Second, to determine scaling laws for various effects as a function of altitude and yield. Third, to determine the effects of high altitude bursts on the ionosphere and on the propagation of radio and radar signals. To gain these objectives, specific effects tests were carried out to provide a basis for a theoretical understanding of the phenomenology of high altitude bursts. Yucca, the first of the three high altitude shots, was prepared and launched from the flight deck of the aircraft carrier USS Boxer. All of Yucca's blast and nuclear radiation instrumentation and a portion of the thermal instrumentation were concentrated in five canisters suspended below the weapon at intervals out to 3,000 feet. These instruments were designed to be activated prior to burst time by telemetered command. Additional instrumentation was carried by three aircraft. Two were modified B-36s positioned at 40,000 feet altitude, 12 miles from the detonation to obtain fireball photography and thermal data. The third aircraft was a P-2V 15 miles from the burst point at 22,000 feet. This aircraft measured infrared phenomena. At 1125 hours on 28 April, when the Yucca balloon was released, the USS Boxer was operating about 90 nautical miles northeast of Nan Island, Bikini Atoll, maintaining a deck wind velocity of near zero. Two and one half hours later, 1,440 hours, at an approximate altitude of 85,000 feet, Yucca was detonated by radio command signal. Failure of the telemeter command transmitter to activate the canister instruments prior to burst time resulted in almost complete loss of data from the balloon dragline equipment. The aircraft mounted instrumentation provided excellent data. Here is a rundown on the results of the fireball studies. 
Yucca produced a bright fireball with a center core, which rapidly developed into a toroid similar to the teapot and plumbob altitude shop. The major part of the thermal pulse lasted about 30 milliseconds, with some perceptible signal for as long as 500 milliseconds. A double maximum was observed in the first part of the pulse, followed by a minimum at 2 milliseconds, then a second maximum at about 13 milliseconds. High-speed spectrograph recordings were made. These showed that during the first 100 microseconds, there were definite discrete absorption spectra in the continuum. Between 100 microseconds and 2 milliseconds, the spectrum was essentially continuous with little or no discrete structure. As the intensity began to rise beyond the minimum, there was a marked appearance of discrete absorption, continuing to just beyond the maximum at 13 milliseconds. After waning, the discrete absorption was replaced by discrete emission lines, or bands, which persisted for the remainder of the bomb pulse. As for Yucca results in the infrared test, instrumentation aboard the P2V showed no observable infrared emission. The teak and orange missile shots were fired from Johnston Island, about 720 nautical miles southwest of Honolulu. Experimental arrays on Johnston for these two shots were essentially identical. Project stations were crammed on Johnston and Sand Island, supplemented by other stations in Hawaii, in aircraft and on shipboard. Each device was sent aloft by an Army Redstone missile. Attached to each missile were four pods, released during the acceleration phase of the Redstone. Three of the pods contained telemetry-equipped instrumentation for the nuclear program. The fourth pod, programmed to be closest to the detonation, was utilized primarily for studying the vulnerability of ICBM structural materials, with particular emphasis on X-ray effects. In addition, neutron flux and energy spectra were investigated by use of neutron activation and fission foils. The first of the two missile shots, Teak, was launched on 1 August. It was planned to detonate at 250,000 feet, approximately six miles south of Johnston Island. However, due to a programming failure, it burst directly over the island at the desired elevation. Orange was launched at 2330 hours from Johnston Island on 12 August. It was detonated at an altitude of 141,000 feet, approximately 26 miles south of the island. At time of burst, middle clouds covered the island. Of the thermal effects studied on both teak and orange, emphasis was placed on three specific objectives. First, to record fireball size and growth. Second, to measure irradiance of the thermal pulse from 2,000 angstroms, far ultraviolet, to 120,000 angstroms, far infrared. Third, to determine the spectrum of the thermal pulse. Infrared studies on the size, duration, and spectral intensity of infrared emissions were made, with the immediate objective of providing input data for the designers of infrared guidance systems. For the measurement of thermal effects, the same aircraft stations and instrumentation as those on Yucca were used. The Teak fireball expanded very rapidly for the first 100 microseconds, reaching a diameter of 10 miles in 10 milliseconds. The Teak infrared fireball was almost 40 miles in diameter at H plus one second, after which it disappeared quickly. The orange fireball expanded more slowly, reaching a diameter of approximately 1.5 miles in 10 milliseconds. The orange infrared fireball, although of the same diameter, lasted somewhat longer than teak. Teak produced a single thermal peak at about 500 microseconds, decaying to less than 25% of the peak value in about 10 milliseconds. The corresponding times for a sea level burst would be two seconds to second maximum, 
and six seconds for the pulse to decay to 25% of peak radiance. The rapid expansion of the early fireball was spectacularly different from a sea level shot. The lower orange shot showed a transition situation with the thermal pulse indicating some of the characteristics of a lower altitude shot, intermediate between peak and surface bursts. There were two peaks, the first of brief duration reaching a maximum at 500 microseconds, and the second consisting of a broad flat maximum lasting from 100 to 300 milliseconds. The spectra of orange consisted of a strong emission continuum with molecular band absorption superimposed. It was followed by molecular band emission beginning at the tail of the thermal pulse. Spectrographic analysis of teak, however, showed no observable continuum. Strong emission bands of excited nitrogen and oxygen were predominant. As a part of the thermal studies, a biomedical project examined the hazard of chorioretinal burns utilizing rabbits for the test. Damage by thermal energy to the retina or to the choroid will leave permanent scars or lesions which will not result in impairment of vision, nor is pain associated with such burns. However, if the burn occurs on the macula, loss of central vision and visual acuity will result. The phenomenon of chorioretinal burn is distinct from that of flash blindness, which is the temporary loss of vision resulting from lesser amounts of thermal energy than that required to produce burns on the inner eye. For the teak shot, animal stations were located on Johnston Island, on aircraft and ships, out to 300 nautical miles. Each station had instrumentation to record the thermal input, and cameras to record the visibility and the attitude of the rabbit's eyes at time of burst. For Orange, there was no station on Johnston Island. The station farthest from the burst was an aircraft at 225 nautical miles at an altitude of 24,000 feet. On peak, chorioretinal burns were produced on all rabbits exposed, except on the surface ship at 300 miles, where clouds and ship roll may have prevented the rabbits from viewing the initial flash. On orange, cloud cover interfered with the surface stations, but burns were received in the aircraft at 225 miles. Retinal burn diameter consistently correlated with distance from burst zero. The lesions produced at all exposure stations within 160 nautical miles were of sufficient size and severity to result in permanent retinal damage or severe loss in visual acuity. Thus, theory is verified that megaton nuclear explosions at the altitudes tested produced chorioretinal burns at great distances as a result of the rapid rate at which the thermal energy is delivered. Most of the energy is delivered before the effective blink reflex time of 250 to 350 milliseconds for rabbits and 100 to 150 milliseconds for man. The teak and orange blast program obtained surface and near surface air blast pressure time measurements. Instrumentation included standard pressure time and very low pressure self-recording gauges located on ground baffles, on 34-foot towers, and on ships backed up by electronic recording gauges. For both shots, the pressure values measured were considerably lower than predicted by conventional methods. On Johnston Island, at a slant range of 252,000 feet from shot teak, the overpressure measured approximately 0.1 pounds per square inch. The same station at a slant range of 196,000 feet from shot orange measured 0.18 pounds per square inch. The nuclear program objectives were to seek data first on neutron flux and energy versus range, and secondly, on gamma radiation. Three of the four instrument pods attached to the missile contained time-dependent radiation detectors. Some of these provided neutron time of arrival data from which energy and flux could be determined. Others gave data on gamma radiation versus time, gamma dose, and gamma ray, as well as electromagnetic effects on equipment components. These pods telemetered data to a receiving station on Johnston Island. 
The fourth pod, programmed to be closest to the detonation, contained threshold foils to determine growth spectral and flux neutron data. This pod was to be recovered after exposure. The pods were ejected at appropriate times to place them at prescribed distances from the burst. Essentially, the desired data were obtained on both shots. Analysis of the neutron energy spectrum has not been completed. At 50,000 feet during peak, the gamma dose rate was about 300 milliroentgens per microsecond at 5 milliseconds. During orange, the gamma dose rates at 5 milliseconds were about 1,000 milliroentgens per microsecond at 30,000 feet slant range and 10 milliroentgens per microsecond at 100,000 feet. The gamma ray measurements were consistent between pods. Both the neutron and gamma ray data continues to be reduced and analyzed for application to the energy partition objective and for estimating the effective destruction range of enemy nuclear warheads at high altitudes. The ICBM structural materials pod deployed from the Redstone missile measured the weapon input and corresponding structural effects caused by exposure to very high altitude nuclear bursts with particular emphasis on X-ray effects. Instrumentation included momentum reaction gauges, radiant energy intensity gauges, and ablation plugs. This pod required post-shot recovery. The teak pod was found intact. The orange pod was not recovered. The TEEK X-ray results showed large thermal X-ray induced mechanical impulses of greater intensity than had been predicted. These impulses are capable of producing structural failures as evidenced by the physical damage inflicted on the front instrument casing of the TEEK pod. There was no evidence to support the existence of an X-ray shadow, that is, a region of low intensity along the longitudinal axis of the TEEK device. The effects of X-ray induced impulses on lead, zinc, iron, copper, and aluminum were appreciable at the estimated slant range of 23,000 feet from the burst. The effect on beryllium could not be measured. One of the most important studies in the high altitude program concerned electromagnetic effects in the upper atmosphere. The possible use of nuclear weapons at high altitude as a defense against ballistic missiles requires that the effects of such bursts on electronic systems be determined. Information was needed to determine the performance of missile guidance systems, missile detection systems, and communication links in these and other situations. Electronic experimentation was conducted on the following effects. Attenuation of electromagnetic signals, ionospheric disturbances, radar reflections or echoes, and noise emission. In probing the attenuation of electromagnetic signals, two distinct types of measurements were made. The first was overknown propagation paths for frequencies ranging from 9 to 450 megacycles. The second type of measurement was the attenuation of cosmic noise. HF transmitters were located on Oahu, Kwajalein, Guam, and Christmas Island. VHF and UHF transmitters were in rockets fired above the burst. Receivers located on Johnston Island monitored transmission from the rockets, as well as the transmission from Oahu. Receivers on Oahu and in an aircraft monitored the transmissions from Kwajalein, Guam, and Christmas Island. These ionospheric communication links all showed a signal strength decrease immediately following the detonation. Cosmic noise receivers were located on Johnston Island, at French Frigate Shoals, and on Oahu. These receivers were operating in the 30, 60, and 120 megacycle band. The normal nighttime ionosphere will give echoes from the F layer when probed with pulses in the frequency range of 1 to 25 megacycles. An ionospheric recorder examining these reflected pulses was located on Johnston Island and another in an aircraft whose mobility could probe the extent of any ionospheric disturbance. Radar reflection from the burst were studied in the 10 to 10,000 megacycle range using a variety of service equipment and five specially constructed sets. Radar sites were located aboard the motor vessel Acania, moored at Johnston Island, 
and an especially instrumented aircraft. At zero times, the aircraft was 225 miles from peak and 125 miles from orange. In addition, ANCPS-9 weather radars were located on Johnston Island and Maui Island, Hawaii. For shot peak, the VHF radars aboard two destroyers at sea approximately 75 and 150 nautical miles from Johnston Island were utilized. These sets were not employed on shot orange. Prior to burst time, radar echoes were being received from clouds, aircraft, and miscellaneous objects. Monitoring of noise emission in the 10 to 1,000 megacycle frequency range was conducted on equipment utilized for other studies. Additional instruments were provided to detect noise at frequencies of 31, 113, 10,000, and 35,000 megacycles. These additional instruments were located at Oahu, Johnston Island, and aboard an aircraft. A brief recapitulation of the findings in line with the general objectives sought from Teak, Orange, and Yucca shows first that high-altitude nuclear detonations are characterized by the rapid development of energy phenomena. The partition of this energy for Teak and Orange manifests itself quite differently from surface and lower air bursts. Much less force is transmitted by blast, while thermal and nuclear radiation are both more intense and extensive in area. Most spectacular was the extent of the fireball growth on Teak, the highest of the three shots, a diameter of 10 miles in 10 milliseconds, accompanied by a striking visual aurora. Peak produced a single peak thermal pulse, while the pulses of orange and yucca showed some of the characteristics of a lower altitude shot, intermediate between peak and surface bursts. Corioretinal burns on both peak and orange were produced over great distances as a result of the rapid rate of thermal energy delivery. This stems from the fact that the bulk of the energy is delivered before the blink reflex can operate. Extensive data on neutron flux and energy at various distances was successfully obtained. Although the 14 MeV flux data were not reduced in the field, preliminary study on lower energy fluxes indicated that they agreed to predicted values within one order of magnitude. The experimental data will serve to guide further theoretical development. The consistent gamma dose rate and dose data obtained with the pods give fundamental information on this radiation under the conditions of the new environment. The ICBM structural material study revealed the existence of large thermal X-ray induced mechanical impulses of greater intensity than had been predicted. Samples of lead, zinc, iron, copper and aluminum were appreciably affected. This closes the preliminary report on the effects of the three Pacific high altitude shots. Since high altitude effects form a comparatively new field of study with far reaching significance, it must be emphasized that much more analysis of the hard tack data will be required before final evaluation of the observed phenomena can be made.
The introduction of powerful anti-submarine nuclear weapons into the Navy's arsenal posed some critical problems. What are the safe standoff distances for various types of vessels operating in the vicinity of subsurface nuclear weapon detonations? And what are the kill ranges for various types of ships? Some of the answers were on hand. Information gleaned from the 1946 Shallow Water Crossroads Baker Shop. the 1955 deepwater wigwam shot, and various high explosive tests. The 1958 underwater testing on Operation Hardtack at the Eniwetok Proving Grounds provided supplementary effects data needed to answer naval tactical questions and supply the host of other vital basic effects information through its two underwater tests, the Wahoo deep water shot and the umbrella shallow water detonation. Target ships, along with YC barges, formed platforms for the vast variety of instrumentation to record the basic shock and radiation phenomena. Off Perry Island in the Eniwetok Lagoon, the fitting out of the heavily instrumented target ship was brought to completion. First came the Wahoo deep water shot, whose surface zero was 8,000 feet outside the lagoon. The 10 kiloton device was placed in water 3,000 feet deep. Downwind from surface zero, the three unmanned target destroyers were moored in line. Several YC barges were interspersed in the destroyer line. The EC-2 target Liberty ship was positioned broadside to surface zero. Target ships had washdown equipment in operation during both shots. The destroyers also had some machinery operating to simulate actual combat conditions. The manned submarine Bonita was submerged at periscope depth. Further out were a number of active manned ships, including the submarine Sterlet. Each hour for the deep water shot was 1330 on 16 May. For the umbrella shallow water shot, the array was moved inside any anyway, top lagoon. Each hour for the shallow water shot was 1115, 9 June. For the underwater pressure effect studies, strings of mechanical and electronic pressure time gauges, as well as ball pressure gauges, were suspended from target ships and barges. On the deep water shot, some strings were suspended to depths of 2,000 feet. On the deep water shot, the variation of peak pressures with range expected for isovelocity water conditions are indicated by this curve. Actual measurements varied from 1,840 PSI near the 2,000 foot range to 45 PSI at 15,000 foot range. The increasing deviation of the two curves with range is due to refraction of the shock wave. The close agreement at short range confirms the isovelocity formula developed from wigwam data, which gave the free water curve. 
The detailed effects of refraction on the shot are under study by several laboratories. Two other underwater studies are here treated briefly. Hydrodynamic yield experimentation to measure the shock wave velocity at early times was attempted on both shots. On Wahoo, the tests were unsuccessful, chiefly due to the lack of a stable platform. On the shallow water shot, telemetered data was obtained from two strings of blast switches, showing an effective hydrodynamic yield of about 10 kilotons. However, pressure distance curves from which hydrodynamic yields are determined showed an as yet unexplained deviation from the slope expected as a result of wigwam studies. One post-shot study was the measurement of the shallow water shot crater. It measured 20 feet in depth, 1,500 feet in diameter, with no crater lip. The underwater pressure and shock results were closely tied in with the ship hull and machinery loading and response studies. For the hull studies, a great variety of gauges were installed on the target vessels to record phenomena on velocities, displacements, deflections, pressure, strains, rolling, and pitching. There was no hull damage to the target destroyers on either shot. Damage from the two shots to the EC-2 merchant ship hull was light, much less than expected. Although the hull suffered cracking and plastic deformation, the inner bottom was not damaged. For that portion of the testing devoted to shock response and damage to critical ship machinery and equipment, several hundred instruments and self-recording shock spectrum gauges were used, along with 40 high-speed motion picture cameras. On the deep water shot, Damage to the destroyer propulsion and auxiliary machinery was negligible. On the shallow water shot, the closest destroyer suffered enough machinery damage to make continued operation questionable. Damage on the other two destroyers was minor. The EC-2 received crippling damage to machinery and equipment, as with the destroyers, the hull alone could take more shock and pressure than the machinery and equipment. One word of caution. All figures throughout this report refer to results obtained under the Wahoo and umbrella conditions. That is, shot yield and geometry, oceanographic conditions, and ship types involved. Now we will consider the submarine on which data was obtained to determine lethal damage ranges to hulls and equipment. Instrumentation included strain, pressure, and deflection gauges, along with high-speed cameras and roll, depth, and flooding indicators. A Squaw 4 5th scale submarine model hull of the SS-563 class was positioned with instrumentation similar to that used in the Squaw on Operation Wigwam. The Bonita received no permanent hull deformations on either shot. Its minimum safe standoff range for the deep water conditions was not directly obtained. Two other underwater response studies were made, both on minefields. One experiment studied the effectiveness of minefield clearance by nuclear weapons. The other mine experiment, also conducted on the shallow water shot, was concerned with the mine actuating influences of nuclear weapons. Some data were obtained, but further study will be necessary to predict the pressure, acoustic, and magnetic effects on the mine. We will now examine the Wahoo and Umbrella studies on visible surface phenomena, the dimensions and extent of spray dome, base surge, and waterways. On the deep water Wahoo shot, the rounded spray dome rose to 900 feet. This was immediately followed by a bubble pulse 
which sent numerous water plumes in a spherical pattern to a height of 1,750 feet. A base surge developed at around 30 seconds and spread out rapidly to about 7,000 feet in crosswind radius and well over 1,000 feet in height at two minutes. The surge was irregular in size and consistency. It was carried downwind beyond the target ship and was barely visible at 12 minutes after the burst. Water waves from Wahoo almost doubled in height as they approached nearby islands raising the water level some 12 feet over the closest island. On the shallow water shot, the spray dome developed rapidly into a columnar plume, attaining a height of 5,800 feet. Except for a tenuous mist at the center, all visible material fell back into the water or the base surge, which appeared in about 13 seconds. At 75 seconds, the surge was about 1,850 feet high, and at seven minutes, its crosswind radius was around 9,500 feet. Wave heights on the shallow water shot agreed with predictions. At 1,500 feet, the crest of the first wave extended 22 feet above the following trough. Beyond 6,000 feet, this highest crest had moved back in the wave train. Shoaling water and coral heads broke the wave up and made inundation of nearby islands negligible. Air overpressures, a determining factor in the use of aircraft for nuclear attacks against enemy submarines, were measured on both underwater shots. Shockwave pressure pickups were suspended from balloons and shipboard mounts on both shots. In addition, on the shallow water shot, 32 rockets deployed the parachute-borne pressure gauges to various heights up to 15,000 feet. On both shots, Peak overpressures at low levels agreed well with predictions. On the umbrella, overpressures at levels above 1,000 feet were generally lower than expected. Maximum pressure recorded was 1.88 PSI. This at 2,500 feet altitude on the shallow water shot at a range of 2,000 feet. This concludes results of the blast and ship response experimentation. Equally extensive were the radiation tests on the two shots, both on basic phenomena and on shipboard vulnerability studies. These nine-foot diameter coracles contained instruments which documented the radiological environment resulting from the Wahoo and umbrella detonations. For Wahoo, 21 coracles were spotted throughout the target array, mostly downwind, moored to the ocean floor, some to a depth greater than 6,000 feet. 26 coracles were placed for the umbrella shot, five deep moored outside the lagoon, the others within the lagoon. Each coracle mounted a specially developed gamma intensity time recorder to define the local gamma field with respect to time. The coracles also housed incremental collectors which sampled the radioactive debris deposited at the coracle position. Some contained probes to measure water radiation levels. Supplementing the coracle assemblies were several score floating film packs dropped over the target array prior to and after zero time to collect total gamma dose data to assist in drawing up dose field contours. Combined results of both shots showed that almost all of the gamma dose occurred within 15 minutes after zero time and was due to the passage of airborne radioactive material. In the shipboard radiation vulnerability study, gamma intensity time recorders of both the unshielded and directionally shielded type were used to document gamma radiation phenomena aboard the target destroyers, both on deck and in compartments. 
Hundreds of film badges were also placed all over the ship. Transit radiation, that is, the cloud and passage of the base surge, contributed practically all of the total dose aboard the ship. The underwater dose and the deposited ship contamination were insignificant. On both Wahoo and Umbrella, four compartments of Destroyer 592 were instrumented with surface samplers, total and time incremental air samplers, gamma intensity time recorders, and animals. Airflow rates for ventilation and boiler combustion were controlled to represent conditions during nuclear attack. Early analysis of the exposed animal data and that from the mechanical samplers on the deep water shot at the 592's range, 4,900 feet, indicated that the dose to personnel inside the ship was generally below the threshold of acute exposure, but that long-term effects might be produced. On the shallow water shot at the 592's range, 3,000 feet, no inhalation hazard capable of producing either acute or chronic effects existed, except possibly chronic effects might result from exposures sustained in the engine room. The washdown systems reduced the fallout contamination by 95%. In summing up, one conclusion towers over all the other underwater test findings on safe standoff ranges. This conclusion is that under the conditions of these tests, radiation dangers dictate ship locations far beyond their hull and equipment shock limit capabilities. The two underwater shots on Operation Hardtack extended our knowledge of nuclear underwater blast, shock, and radiation effects. A great deal of information was gained, which upon completion of analysis will help to provide answers to naval tactical problems.